Just Facebook came about talking about how important the jam were to us and what it means. It was 240 solid pages of rare accounts, rare photos. We brought in fans as well as the people who work with the jam, like Dennis Monday and Bill Smith, the sleep designer. What we did was get people stories that you wouldn't normally hear. Well, then, of course, the three members of the jam got bought. But there were people like Bill and Dennis and so forth that, well, they were working with the band, they were fans of it as well, of the music, yeah. so they weren't just talking dryly or business talk. If they're passionate about a subject, they can talk about it naturally. Yeah. And what you get when fans write about a book, they write about their experience, and what comes through their experience is what it means to them, the importance, the passion. We wanted that in the book, we wanted that to come through. Listening to the John Peel show I'd heard in the city, I thought it was so different from the punk that he'd been playing, it's just, just mind blowing. The front of in the city cover, you know, the black suits and the spray can logo. I was 10, 11 years old at the time. This ain't hit me with them, you know, I, I just found out sort of bond with them. This is the modern world by the jam. Before I'd even played it, it was just a sleeve, it just seemed it was saying something different, and especially the back the back sleeve where the bass player's in mid-air pose, leaping through the air, and you think, you know, what does this sound like? And then obviously put it on and it was just something else. I pulled out all my cons and I played it, and it was like, you know, Jesus Christ, this is so amazing. I was still a kid, I was still in like things like Cracker Jack, you know, Beat Plays and Action Man and stuff like that. And it, it, it just sort of formed a bond with me. You know, I looked, got the sleeve notes, read them, read them, read them again. I first saw the jam, I think I was, must have been 16. So the Red Cow in Hammersmith, but, uh, I can still remember it, it was absolutely, it was electric. As we went in, paid our money, John was on the door, his dad, dad. He was giving out these badges, the jam, live at the Red Cow. I think I've still got it, sad but true. <laughs> But it was an amazing gig, and it was packed out, it was hot, sweaty, the energy was amazing. I mean, Thursday you know, night was always, you, wherever you was, you always went back to the top of Pops Brown that sort of time. Anyway, you always went back, make sure you got back for that. David Watts, I always remember a massive, massive um, seeing that one the first times. It was Top of Pops, it was that polka dot shirt and that ripping back and guitar. As soon as I saw that, it all changed. Everything changed. Well, I remember the minute I got into the jam world, we were sitting in the car and Town Called Mally's come on the radio and we were just about to pull up to my house. So I said, hold on a minute, Dad, I want to listen to this. And he said, oh, we've got the box set indoors. So he gave me the, the box set and from then on, it just became an obsession. Like, I'd listen to every single track. About five or six first heard him because it was just always playing. And my dad said to my mum, how, how does she know all the words? I was like, just played for my life, really. When you're young, yeah. um, it might not be the, the, the best single, but to me it just means so much, like, just the lyrics in it, you know, life is a drink, you get drunk when you're young. Sort of makes, it appeals to me, like, I'm at an age where, you know, that really identifies with me. I've got my own time, I think the lyrics are brilliant for that. At the time you didn't really know what they were about as an 11 year old, but as you get older, you read into the lyrics more. And um, you know, that's what life is about, you know, meet a girl, fall in love with her, I think that's it. And you know, you're beating best friend, you've got so many ideas, and then nothing, you know, you turn a corner and everything changes in your life. I can remember being at a party, going back to that time when I was just sort of leaving school when they put on them going underground at a party. And it was like that moment in Quadrophenia when they put on My Generation and everyone just went ballistic, kind of out of the blue, to that song. And that was kind of one of the points when I thought, wow, this band's got something going for them, you know what I mean? Because the whole party just erupted and everyone was jumping around, throwing beer, throwing beer around. I Need You, I decided there and then, best love song I was ever going to hear in my life. Um, and Life From A Window, I decided there and then was my funeral song, which it's still going to be. Oh, sound effects without a doubt. Just love it. Um... It's really unique, I think it's un a uniquely British psychedelic record. It's um, got that dense kind of sound. I think it's just a masterpiece from start to finish. Man in the corner shot sound effects. It's like Ellis Lowry. I mean, you can see the little man going on a little shot. No, little Peyton here, whatever it was. I think that really is a picturesque song, very Beatlish. But the lyrics, you know, Genesis, the man in the corner shot, it's just, you know, it speaks about in inequality, but also envy at the same time. So that to me was one of the most political records that the jam done and that definitely did shape me, you know. Should be the manifesto of action that the Labour Party should use now. Oh, eating rifles. I mean, who, who consider that taking on a load of Etonians and being beaten by them, just like we are now? 
punk was really interesting, a lot of ideas and that, but I just thought there's more to music than three chords and not being able to express a vocal range. As Paul Weller just had, just completely blew away that idea. There was the energy, the passion, the lyrics, and the fashion element, and it wasn't restricted by punk, you know, so it sort of went on beyond punk. Their songs were, were kind of more thought out. Uh, because I, I played guitar, I was into chords, etc. And, and the chord structuring, uh, middle eights, endings, the intros, there was more thought behind it, I thought. Yeah, they weren't just um, thrashing around on no. the guitar and just making a noise. Wasn't they it? weren't the damned. No. Even though the damned were good. Well, it seemed to go out of his way to antagonise the sort of... What, what, what Dave Cairns would call the punk elite, because we burning sniffing glue on stage as he did. Uh, and then the quote which got him in trouble when he said he was going to vote Tory, which was, he never did, but he, he just, that was just a joke to wind up the clash, I think, when I was supporting the clash at the time. But he, he seemed to consciously go out of his way to, to maintain that separateness. There was definitely a connection with it being a more working class take. And that was a very much a counter to, and a parallel to, to sort of what, you know, the accusations of, say, the Clash being art school kids and, and the rest of it. And, you know, but even so, you know, members of the Clash were definitely working class, you know. But it was, the, the, that's where a sort of split came. And therefore, I think a lot of kind of, especially like football kids, got drawn to the jam because of that. You know, that it much more was, you know, they were one of us, sort of, or they were us, so to speak. They were right on that cusp of not quite punk not quite new wave. That's why I think, as a band, you know, they sit outside almost both those genres, almost in a genre of their own. The big turning point, that, that, as we say, me and sort of my little crowd, was that we went to see the jam port in the clash at the Rainbow. Because we met at Liverpool Street, and there used to be a little street market outside the police station. And um, we lifted these mohair jumpers, and we thought, oh, they're, they're, they're all right, you know, sort of almost punk wear. And uh, we we got up the rainbow and um, a jammed um, blistering set. And I remember this like moment, really rev revelation, turning there and going, this is it, this is this is where we're going mod full time. And I mean, literally ripped these jumpers off that we ripped, threw them down and that's it. And it was like, and I don't know when that was sort of autumn 77, something like that. But I mean, you know, I think there'd, there'd been sort of people with mod sensibility going to see the jam before that and obviously attracted to sort of the way that they dressed, you know. Although there had been mods around since 76 in little individual pockets and even as late as 78 they didn't realise each other existed and so by the time we had the Great British Music Festival, I think the jam played the end of November at the Wembley Arena, they were headlining on the first night. That's the first time all those different mods who were calling them, who were consciously called themselves mods, like Tony Morrison, like Grant Fleming, uh, Oxton Tom, people like that. That's the first time they realised there was more than just them. That pilgrimage thing was, uh, yeah, I made the flyer up, and um, I was surprised how many people actually came along because I thought it would just be, you know, maybe the same sort of crowd that was going to see football matches and uh, see England abroad, and you know, kind of already travelling, but. No, 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 it was a good crowd turned out. The important thing about Paris more than anything is it was where it really started to crystallise as a, a movement, the old mod thing. Now, many japes, uh, not really that much that's repeatable here, to be quite honest. Um, I think, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a long time ago, but I think they still get nicked for some of it. The first album cover were very much I want to make it look like it's a toilet in a tube station and you've just run down the tube station, you've escaped for somewhere and you've literally just all sat down and just before you've sat down, put our tag on here. Very grainy, very gritty, um, like a newspaper idea. And then of course on the back, you know, well, we'll just smash it up a little bit. This is a band that actually means business, so let's make them look like they mean business. The idea was to try and do an urban landscape. This was shot underneath the Westway. I tried to do it in a postmodernist sort of way. You know, for instance, Paul came with just a white jumper but wanted to put arrows on it so that it sort of looked something a bit, bit hooish. So we did all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's shot, it shot in daylight but using um, a flash photography, etc. So that it just got a, a, a sort of quite a, an urban, sort of gritty sort of feel to it. <laughs> Because they had a bit of a crisis, the jam. Um, the second album got attacked in a few places, Enemy, I'm pretty sure. Uh, 
and it was they then they had the problem with in America with the American tour that didn't quite work and they came back and they they'd been writing for the third album and they ditched quite a few of the songs they said the songs were too samey too boring they delivered what everybody thought was the third album and they were rejected they didn't take too kindly to the way Polydor treated them I mean uh, it was pretty hellish and I had meetings with the boys and John and it, I remember driving home one night and I thought I really don't want this job it wasn't me it was just the shit that was going down with the company well his back was up against this wall his songwriter had tried up and Polydor were about to write him off somewhere somehow after all this he started writing the best songs he'd ever done he's like Mr Clean down to at midnight Billy Hunt, in the crowd. All this stuff went on at All More Cons. And when he came up with All More Cons, you, you, you'd look at it and you think, well, he's got three singles on. So you'd, initially, you'd, mm -hmm. but when you played the album, it was so good. And you could hear the maturity, the way he was actually, the, the, the song, song structures, the lyrics were great. And of course, if you, when you opened it up and you had the Vesper on the inner sleeve and you had the Scar album, that's what really kick-started that whole mod revival, running, as I... I called it the mod renewal. All my con. That is just when the jam started to really take off. After that came out, it just went crazy. They got a real hardcore following. Even after all mod cons, I mean, the company went off the boil. I mean, that was, as far as the company were concerned, that was it. My, I remember my boss actually told me, he said, when the punk ship sinks, it's going down with all that. The company's gone, the old bums have gone. And they, and punk was imploding, so they just thought, like Sham 69, like all the other bands, they would disappear. I mean, I never really believed that because All My Cons is such a good album uh, in, in every aspect. The great songs, the, the whole thing. I mean, he came of age. He, he went from being like a teenager with talent to being a teenager with real talent. Even though all of us all love My Cons, Polydor still weren't convinced. The turning point was when Eating Rifles suddenly gave the jam their first top 10 hit. Polydor suddenly realised they had something special on their hands and said, if we put a bit of clout behind their next single, we could ourselves to number one. The first number one that was special. I remember when I was told, I leapt in the air. Unfortunately, I was inside the door and I waited on the jam and I'm walking around like, Ugh. And realising that, you know, they were, they had become the biggest band in the world was just, you know, I was with them. You'd seen them, you'd talked about them, you'd talked about them at school, you'd read about them, and suddenly they're on the TV, they've got an album out, they're number one. And they... Well away in the apron when they performed Going Underground on Top of Cops. And when you had the pinny thing back to front, you know what no, who knows, Paul's Paul. I mean, he, he does whatever he wants to do. He does something and then regrets it, which he did. I think I even asked my mum to buy me an apron and I think she realised I was losing the plot at that age because <laughs> I actually wanted to wear one at the youth club. You should have to look well turned out. It's, it's a state of mind that they've got you into. Being working class, you, you appreciate nice clothes. All the punk idea of like ripped up t-shirts, shit jeans and Converse trainers just really wasn't for me. I, I appreciated the nice polo shirts, the straights, suit jackets, the silk scarves, the smart shoes. I've taken that album sleeve into many hairdressers. <laughs> Not yet got the light blue stay press so. though. They're not stupid jump shoes, all the duff colours up and you'd be like, yeah, I like the band, but I'm not going that far, you know what I mean? You walk around Manchester with them on, you get slapped. And I used to badger my mum for a pair of these shoes, badger. Jam badgers, yeah. Yeah, I had the bowling shoes, the uh, the jam stay shoe that had the white stripe up the front and looked like a pair of trainers with shoes. Boating blazer. It was hard to get them in that size as well, because I was so small, but there was a little place just off Carnaby Street that you could get one. Yeah, I had to get myself off and get one of those little black and white mini dresses. Got in big shit one particular winter when my mum and dad gave me money to go and get my school coat I think they were expecting me to go down CNA and get like, a nice little grey flannel affair but I had to go to Carnaby Street and get a red denim jacket like Paul Weller. We tried to mimic it as best we could yeah with a you know, cheap old polyester blazer. And... The black and white white and black polka dot shirt that to me was always quite a stylish I've been buttoned down I'm still wearing buttoned downs now that, that entire mod ethos that, that you, that you learn about by following that band and also obviously specifically Weller. And I suddenly start seeing kids older than me or kids my age walking about with parkers on, the jam on it, and you felt like, Jesus Christ, this is some revolution. 
going to see him and seeing other people at the gigs was a huge part for me. You turn up outside and there would just be loads of people that you knew. Uh, things like that, that was massive. I'll say that was one of the biggest parts for me, seeing people, even if you didn't know everybody, just recognising faces that you knew. It felt like a, like a family event in that respect. Nervous all day, it was like going to the cup final really. And, um completely distracted, nothing else. And I was fortunate, I was still very young, I was just a teenager, I was just 13, and I was fortunate to have older older people around that, that kind of took to us and thought, you know, take them with you. And it was it was, it was mind blowing to be 13 and see that. Really. Getting into that gig and I've never known an atmosphere like it. And I was only a little chap then anyway. And uh, he just said to me, one of the old boys said to me, pretend to faint. So I thought, what's all that about? So I pretended to faint, the next one right at the front. I mean, right at the front where, where there would shake his head and the sweat is smacking you in the face as well, so... Whoosh, his neck was like that. <laughs> and it was just like, fuck me, this is so hell. The energy. There was trouble with the sound, and he got angry. He tended to play better. And of course, remember, if, he, if there were some problems, and he played it in rifles, it always seemed to be the best. And it was just, yeah. as soon as we walked in there, it just, hairs on your back came up, and you thought, this is, this is special. And we, we, we clambered over all the seats, managed to get to the front, and it was just one of them nights where you just, you know, you just didn't want time to stop. I spent nearly all week's wages um, on a ticket from a tout to sit in the Poxy East balcony. <laughs> and then spent the whole gig thinking, can I jump down there or not? I made my way to the front, nearly had my ribs crushed. And the bouncers were trying to pull me over because they could see I was in trouble, but I wasn't having it. The stewards didn't stand a chance that night. You know, everyone just ripped it up. Then you realise how big it was, how much it meant to everybody else. This when you when you went then, so gigs the overwhelming atmosphere. It, it felt so energised. Just the way uh, the were with the fans as well. I think that was a real big thing as well. It, it was it, it was you really felt that connection. They always wanted to give something back to their fans. They weren't just about making the money. Oh, you know, obviously they made a nice couple of quid, but the jam were all about interacting with us kids. Feeling that you were kind of mates with them as well, which you know exists to this day. Once I start to know about the sound checks. Um, I used to go along if I could, and then they, they always, nearly always used to let us in, and they were just fantastic like that. Um, so then sometimes you speak to them after, sometimes to get something signed. Uh, I just thought they were just really accessible. Sound checks was a bit of a story of a bunch of school to go up the rainbow in 79. I was at school with a few jam fans itself, and uh, obviously being about 11, 12, I was a bit too young to go to the concert itself, but nothing was going to stop me going to the sound check, so it was straight to school. Straight out the gate, home again, changing my best clothes I had, and on the train up to Finsbury Park. And uh, as a jam, people would say, you know, the jam was fabulous for letting their fans into the sound checks and having a chat with the, with the crowd, you know, Paul, Rick, and Bruce, and even John. We, we used to get in the sound checks, you know, 30, 40 kids waiting outside. And John, you know, John had let you in, and Kenny had sort of, Kenny weren't so keen, but, you know, how did you get in? You just sort of nod a wink at John, and he let you know, all right, and, you know, if John said it was all right, and it was all right. John Weller was the fourth member. Well, I think without John Weller, there wouldn't have been the jam. He's the one that got in the van and drove them up and down the country in the back of a transit. You know, I think with Jack, John, getting them into these gigs, pushing the management of these bars and nightclubs and so forth, I don't think the jam would have made it. John sounded like Mike Reed to me. He had the same sort of voice, type of swagger to him and the way he spoke. I've, I've never heard anyone this John. Every, everyone's got positive words about Mike. <laughs> I remember where I was in Gales News Agents in Addiston and the enemy was, I was just a disciple of the enemy because you know it, it, his interviews were always great and there was the headline, the jam split shock, and then he opened up for that statement that we all know so well. Yeah. And I was I was literally was well enough. I had tears in my eyes, you know, I literally well, I thought this is the end, this is it, what are we gonna do now? It's all over. And because you know, it felt like our band, it was like defining the soundtrack in the youth and you just thought, well what, what's left? What else is out there? Duran Duran. You know, it's not going to happen. I felt like it was all over. I was really, you know, I was cut up, gutted. But quickly, I must admit, quickly, I did see what he meant. That clarion call and that wake up call spoke to me as well. You know, the dig the new breed thing. You could see Paul was moving away. And he told me at the time, and I'll never forget it in Polydor Studios, that we were talking about, I, I'm not sure what, but he said, I don't want the jam to become like the hoop. I want us to go out at the top not just go around doing our greatest hits. I was gutted because they're my favourite band, they seem to be doing so well, or they were doing well. Um, but then I thought to myself, I think there's so many people who've carried on, bands I've liked over the years, who've carried on, 
um, and maybe when they should have stopped. And I thought to actually stop at this time was such a brave decision. It wasn't a tear thing, it was just one of them, you're just scratching your head, just thinking, why? why? It was all about why. Why have they broken up? Why? They're, just, they're, they're at the top of their game. They had so much more to give, a lot more to give. And um, they, yeah, we all wanted another album out of them. It should have happened. It was becoming so big that it didn't become naff. Or it was just on the borderline of becoming a bit naff. So it was better that they split before it became some huge kind of super group. The way Jam, we're, we're getting better all the time. I, I wish I had stayed together for at least one more album. Disbelief, really, you know. It's just saying silly talking about it now, but, you know, it's like the, the world had come to an end. It was, like, what am I going to do now? This has been my life for five years, and, you know, it's all. all Everything was based, you know, around the jam. Uh, that, and that's what I really think that I took from it is just the um, the honesty from it, really, and, and the integrity. I'm a suburb boy, and what they made me do is go into London, get on a train, go into London, see London, take it all in, walk around the streets, walk around the West End. I was 12 years old. It just, I just wanted to go into the West End and just see it, take it all in. That's what they made me do, and I'll love them for that forever. You know, if you don't want to read Wilfred Owen, then listen to Little Boy Soldiers when you're 16. <laughs> um, and you can dance to it. To show that it's about young people and it's about music just doesn't have to be something you out your computer screen. It can sort of, you know, it can make you feel things, it can make you do things, it can make you dress in a certain way, which is exactly what the jam done to me. Being a graffiti artist, the jam were about you know, re rebelling against society but at the same time not being something too obtuse for people not to handle. I mean what we do is we're essentially painting trains, we're making the mundane beautiful. When I heard someone describe Weller like that I was like that's exactly what we're doing with spray cans, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to, we want to brighten up people's lives, we're not here to smash windows in, we just want to, we want to rebel against mundane society that's not necessarily making something that makes people upset. We just want to make something beautiful, leave a lovely little mark and then just go about day to day life. You know, I think a lot of a lot of graffiti writers I've known have identified with the jam. I know Score TRC for a fact says his favourite song of all time is English Rose. Drax is a huge fan as well. You know, for for yeah, for giving you that fuel for going out on a bombing mission as well, the early jam stuff in the city, non-stop dancing, just it's just fuel for when you're out, a couple of pints with your mates, spray cans in tow, probably your mother's brother. The jam totally inspired an entire mo movement, fanzine writers, poets, yeah. loads of them. The good thing about the jam is that that gave you that inspiration. I can do what I want to do and that's why I'm doing my website now, Zoning, and that is like, it wouldn't have existed without that sort of passion that the jam gave me. The things I'm doing now, I still, I always go back to them days because when I come out of school, no qualifications, didn't, you know, hated school. Well, I'll always be thankful people took taught how to read and write, that's about it. I hated it. So, you know, the rest of the world that was out there, the sort of creative world, the, the sort of, that world of fear and film, they had no idea about it yet. Because really, what, what, when I grew up in a council state, it was football, music, the clothing, that was it. You didn't, that was a small little world you was in. And you was in that sort of group of, maybe 15, 20 guys, and that's all you did. So to find out about museums and stuff like that, it was, you know, it wasn't the sort of thing we did. But I think by reading the interviews of well I did, and you know, some of the references you got out of that, it opened up a different world. And I think that's why the things I'm doing now, I'll still always give that a name check and nod back to them days. The noise that they were three geezers made gone, went from dark to shade. But it was always positive. I felt that they um, stood for the things that I believed in. I had the greatest thing on six legs. Powerful, loud, British. Wonderful. The best fucking band in the world. Best fucking band in the world. The best fucking band in the world. Power of youth. Just pure brilliance and poetic. It's, you can't, you can't even describe it. You, you have to listen. <laughs>